Hello everyone, this is Bhavik Choksi over here and welcome to the revision lecture for India 16 property plant and equipment. So this is an important standard and forms the basis of a lot of standards which are linked to assets like investment property, like intangible assets to some extent impairment etc as well. So it is a tier 1 category standard from an exam perspective. So what we have done is we are going to do a quick chart based revision. Uh, the contents of this uh, uh, are based on the contents of the institute material, our FR shield etc where we have compiled and tried to uh, do a quick revision covering all your concepts. We will not be solving sums over here but this will act as a very good refresher before you probably start your second revision for index 16 or even uh, if time permits the day before your exam. So let us get started. What do you mean by PP? Well PP refers to property plant and equipment. It has three main features. First it has to be tangible. Second it has to be held for use. Now use can be administrative use, can be selling and distribution like a delivery van, can also be uh, for finance or employee welfare. So for example laptops, computers etc. It can be any use. Even pollution control equipment are considered to be assets which are held for use. Obviously assets for production uh, and distribution are very much held for use but this is use has to be given a very wide meaning. So first it has to be tangible in nature. Second it has to be held for the purpose of use. Third what is that feature which distinguishes a PP? Well the life. The life of the asset is almost always more than 12 months if it has to go into the PP standard. So the useful life has to be greater than or equal to 12 months for it to be classified as PP. So any tangible asset held for use with a life of greater than 12 months like your motor vehicles, land, building, machinery etc will fall under the PP definition. However, there are certain scope exclusions which have been outlined by the standard primarily because they have been covered by some other relevant standards. First being non-current assets held for sale. These are covered by a separate accounting standard called as INDES 105 and hence removed out of INDES 16. Secondly, assets which are involved in the exploration and evaluation work which is linked to mining operations for which there is a separate accounting standard called as INDES 106 which is not there in your CA final syllabus but nevertheless you should be aware that certain exploratory assets uh, or assets which are linked to finding mineral resources are not to be covered by the standard. And third, which is a slightly important point in my understanding, is biological assets which are held for agricultural use uh, are beyond the scope of the standard. So for someone like Amul, if they are holding cows, they are actually uh, tangible assets which are having a life of more than 12 months. However, since they are living assets, biological in nature, they will be covered under a separate accounting standard called as INDES 41, which is on agriculture. Remember only biological assets which are used for agricultural purposes will go under INDES 41. There is an exception to this which is bearer plants. Bearer plants are plants which bear agricultural produce like a coconut tree for example bears coconuts and is not agricultural produce itself. For example a bamboo or a sugar cane is agricultural produce itself and as a result bearer plants have been said to be covered under INDES 16 only. So scope exclusion applies to all biological assets used for agricultural use except for bearer plants. Bearer plants are plants which bear agriculture produce and not produce themselves uh, and these plants are covered under index 16. Sir, we are not a farmer, we don't know much about bearer plants. Well, understandable, typically you should remember that thumb rule is fruit plantations. Uh, like mangoes, apples etc uh, would be bearer plants. Even tea coffee rubber plantations would be taken as bearer plants if there are certain complex trees like in one of the RTPs institute has something about Pinus radiata tree. But they will guide you. They will say that well this is a tree which uh, does not bear any produce but it will be cut after 30 years for the purpose of uh, construction. So we will say okay it is a produce itself. The tree itself is a produce, it does not bear any separate produce. So this is uh, regarding bearer plants which are covered by INDES 16. Okay, uh, Pinus radiata in that example if you have studied uh, under INDES 41 is not a bearer plant because it is a produce whereas a coconut tree or a mango tree is a bearer plant. Aja, then you go to the initial recognition. Uh, PP should be initially recognized at cost. This was a given in older standards, the accounting standards. However, if you go to indices, a lot of indices like 
109 like 41 for example require an initial recognition at fair value however in dash 16 clearly tells you that well the initial recognition should be at cost and what is cost the amount that you have paid for the asset so if you have purchased the asset the purchase price will be the part of the cost however you might have received certain discounts like a trade discount trade discounts are always reduced from the price and uh, if the asset has an mrp of thousand and there's a trade discount of hundred then the assets cost to you is for example 900 now what about taxes indirect taxes so something like gst import duty says uh, taxes the standard says and rightly so that if these taxes are non-refundable or non-creditable then they should form a part of the your cost because uh, the asset is worth hundred 18% is a GST, you have to pay 118, you don't get credit for 18 and hence 118 is your overall price that you paid for the asset. However, if that 18 is creditable or you will get a refund or a drawback, then that 18 is not really a cost, it is just a deposit and you are going to claim a credit for that and hence it should not be a part of the cost of the asset. So only the non-refundable or non-creditable taxes should be a part of the cost. So there is purchase price, non-refundable or non-creditable taxes, subtract trade discount, and then you add what you call as directly attributable expenses. Directly attributable expenses are directly connected with the acquisition or construction of the asset. The standard has not given a list of directly attributable expenses. However, they have given certain items which are definitely not directly attributable. Something like an inauguration expense which is linked to uh, the selling and distribution functions is not a directly attributable expense. Uh, uh, secondly, if there are losses or expenses that are incurred after the asset is ready for commercial use it should not be a part of the cost of the asset third if there are certain expenses to train the employees uh, then it should not be a part of the assets like you buying a computer and then your employees don't know how to use a computer you give them a training program well the computer is ready to use your employees don't know how to use it that does not mean you increase the cost of the computer training expenses uh, will go to the PNL and lastly uh, at the time of initial recognition any relocation expenses will not be a part of the cost relocation it itself means it is relocation which means the asset is in the current location as desired and now you're relocating it should not be a part of the cost of the asset so directly attributable expenses like freight inward insurance on purchases etc will be installation expenses will be a part of the cost of the asset pre-production testing all of these will be a part of the cost of the asset now what about losses there can be normal loss there can be abnormal loss the standard says normal loss should be a part of the cost whereas abnormal loss should be taken to the profit and loss account this is based on general accounting uh, cost accounting principles administrative selling and distribution expenses are not linked to the construction or acquisition directly and hence administration and selling and distribution expenses will also be taken to the PNL typically then comes a fairly important item which is present value of site restoration uh, the institute calls this as decommissioning dismantling or site restoration what do you mean well these are obligations which which force an employee whether legally or constructively legal obligation means as per law you have to do a particular thing constructive means as per past practices or published policies uh, uh, your actions have created an expectation in the minds of the affected parties now what do you mean by site restoration for example if you were to construct a factory or dig a mine at a particular location uh, the government is worried that at the end of the useful life if you just leave the factory as it is or you leave the mine as it is uh, it might be potentially hazardous or harmful for the people over there and as a result like it's if it's a nuclear plant the government would say that well after 10 years when you operate the nuclear plant you have to dismantle it uh, you have to restore the site to the location and the condition as it was before now one can always say that well this is an expense which is going to be incurred in the future so let us forget it right now why should it be a part of the cost of the asset remember you are doing accounting as per accrual and not as per the cash system of accounting as per accrual when does the obligating event happen what is that event which gives rise to the obligation to restore the site it is the construction of the factory you have constructed the factory for some reason let us say the factory uh, uh, you don't want to continue operations Will you still have to dismantle it? Yes. It is not that the dismantling obligation arises because 10 years have passed. The dismantling obligation arises the moment you construct the asset. It is like, loosely speaking, it is like warranty. For example, in your inter CA, when you have created the provision for warranty, uh, we, when you make the sale of the goods, immediately you create a provision for warranty based on the expected uh, estimated repair cost. 
well the repairs are going to happen in the future however you still create a provision for warranty the logic over here being that warranty uh, the the birth of warranty is the sale the moment you do the sale you are under an obligation to repair even if the next second a customer comes with a defective product in a similar way the obligation to restore the site arises the moment you construct the site yes you might actually incur it at a later date However, the obligation arises now and hence as per India's 37, you will have to create a provision for site restoration the moment the construction of the asset is completed. Achha, if you have to create a provision, you will credit the provision, then what will you debit? Well, this restoration obligation will increase the cost of the asset. Sir, how does it increase? Let us assume there are two proposals that you have. One is a proposal to construct an asset which involves an immediate cost of 100 rupees, no further obligation. Another is a proposal to construct the asset which involves an immediate cost of 90. However, you are compulsorily required to restore this asset at the end of let us say 10 years, which will cost you another 50 rupees at the end of 10 years. So one would say that if I ignore that 50 rupees now, then the first asset which is uh, uh, worth 100 will be more expensive and the second asset worth 90 is less expensive which is factually wrong because in the first asset apart from 100 you don't have to incur any separate cost for the asset however for the second asset apart from 90 you also have to spend 50 rupees well at the end of 10 years but you have to spend 50 rupees and hence you will have to recognize the provision it in today's terms at present value that is a credit effect and the second effect that is a debit effect will go against the cost of the asset. This will make the asset more expensive, more costly and as a result, the provision for site restoration will increase the cost of the asset. So the present value of site restoration will increase the cost of the asset initial recognition by on a today's present value basis. You will estimate the site restoration expenses. Obviously, these estimates can change and then you will discount it at today's terms taking the discount rate. Aja. This is for a purchased assets. Well, there can be a self-constructed asset. If you're constructing the asset on your own, then instead of the purchase price, you will have uh, the production cost, like the direct materials, the direct labor, the direct expenses, overheads, whether it is uh, variable or fixed, as long as they are production overheads. So materials, labor, production overheads, uh, etc. All of these will be a part of the cost, even if uh, uh, this asset involves a site restoration obligation or a decommissioning obligation, the present value will be added. Okay. Now, what about borrowing costs? Will borrowing costs form a part of the cost of the asset? Just a second. Will borrowing costs form a part of the cost of the asset? The answer is depends on index 23, which is similar to AS 16. So what does index 23 tell you? Index 23 tells you, which is a standard on borrowing cost, that if your asset is a qualifying asset, what do you mean by qualifying asset? Qualifying asset refers to an asset which takes a substantial period of time. Just a second. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so qualifying asset is an asset which takes a substantial period of time to be ready for its intended use. Substantial period has not been defined, but loosely speaking, 12 months is taken as a substantial period. Having said that, you can write a note in the exam uh, to assume even a period of 8 months, 9 months to be a substantial period. But typically, if nothing is given, institute in direct index 16 cases can take 12 months to be a substantial period of time. If the asset is taking a substantial period of time, that is more than 12 months, loosely speaking, then it is a qualifying asset and the borrowing cost which is attributable to this qualifying asset should be a part of the cost of the asset. So borrowing cost will be added to the constructed asset or even in rare cases to the purchased asset if it takes a substantial period of time to be ready for its intended use. Remember if there are any abnormal wastages or abnormal losses uh, in the material labor etc they will not form a part of the cost of the asset. Okay so this is regarding the general cases for initial recognition. There can be two special cases for initial recognition. First of all being deferred payment which means you have bought the asset today however the payment is going to be made either in one shot or in installments which go at or beyond 12 months which is beyond the normal credit period. The standard believes that if someone is giving you a credit of 12 or more months, they are implicitly going to recover the time value from you. If the credit period is two or three months, maybe it is negligible. That is the normal credit period. Probably they will not recover any time value or even if they do, uh, the adjustment is quite insignificant. However, if the payments go at or beyond 12 months from the date of your purchase, the standard implicitly believes that there would be some hidden interest. And if you do not do any adjustment, that interest will go as a part of the cost of the asset. For example, if I were to buy an AC today, it cost me 20,000 rupees if I do an immediate payment. On the other hand, if 
I can buy the essay today, but uh, on installments and I have to pay, for example, Lucy speaking, 24,000 rupees after two years. In that case, one would say that, okay, on the invoice, I can see 24,000 and hence the AC costs 24,000. However, 4,000 is attributable to time. It is not attributable to the AC. The AC has the same tonnage, the same capacity, the same brand. And why are you, why, why am I paying 4,000 more? I'm paying 4,000 more for the time. And that is finance cost. And finance cost should not be a part of the cost of the asset unless it is a qualifying asset as per Indus 23. This is a ready to use AC. I have installed it today. Yes, I'm going to make the payment after two years. So the standard says, ideally, you should recognize assets at their present value or what you call as their cash price, which is the present value of the future cash. So you will recognize the assets at their present value or their cash price if the payment goes at or beyond 12 months. So deferred payment, where payment terms are at or beyond 12 months, which is beyond normal credit. This There is a hidden financing transaction, that is there is a hidden interest or a loan or a financing element involved, in which case a PPE should be recognized at cash price. Cash price means the price today. If the cash price is not available, then the present value of agreed payments can be taken. Okay, like 24,000 ka present value aapko nikalna if that 20,000 number was not available. Okay, however, if the payment terms are less than 12 months, for example, someone gives you a one or a two month credit, then you don't need to do this uh, time value adjustment, whatever is there in the invoice, you take that as the purchase price, you do you either the standard believes that the time value is insignificant because it is two months or there's no real time value charge, it is a part of the normal business credit. So there is no hidden financing in such cases and the transaction in such a case will be recognized at the agreed invoice price. Okay, this is the first special case. The second special case over here is in case of a barter. This is fairly important from an exam standpoint and this same guidance also repeats in case of intangibles, in case of investment properties, etc. So when we look at a barter, so barter over here refers to exchange of assets. Now, the problem in barter as compared to the regular purchase transaction is you don't have a specified purchase price. You don't have a cash amount because you're exchanging assets. So for example, you're giving uh, machinery and acquiring land. So in your invoice, you can see that, well, for a plot of land, you have given, let us say, 10 units of machinery. You don't know the rupee value. And that is, that is what makes barter a little challenging when it comes to accounting. So at what value should you recognize? Well, if the amount paid in rupees is not determinable. You will have to recognize it at fair value. Comes the next challenge. What fair value? Now, the language which is used by the institute or as per the index is slightly uh, confusing. The standard says that you will recognize the asset acquired at the fair value of the assets given up unless the fair value of the assets received is more reliably determinable. Now, as a student, we will see both the values, one of the asset given up, one of the asset received, and to us, they are equally clear. We can't figure out which of the two is more clear, and hence, we need a rule which tells us which of the two should we take. So, over here in general barter cases, and I'm referring to general barter cases, uh, we will take the first preference as a fair value of the assets given up. Sir, why? Well, that is the cost that you are paying. So if the asset was worth 2,000 rupees, let us say it was a cash transaction, asset was worth 2,000 rupees and there was a discount offer by which you got the asset at 1,000 rupees. What you have given up is worth 1,000 of cash. The asset may have an MRP or a fair value of 2,000. You have paid 1,000 rupees in cash. So that is the cost of the asset for you. In a similar way, if you are acquiring a plot of land by giving up machinery, the price that you are paying is actually the machinery. And the value of the machinery will be taken as the initial cost for the land acquired. Okay. However, if the machinery is such that the fair value cannot be determined reliably, it's a completely new type of machinery it does not have a market. If you cannot reliably determine it, if one is not available, then the fair value of the asset received, then we say, okay, if the fair value of the machinery, what I'm giving is not reliably determinable, let me take the fair value of the plot of land. And if that is also not possible, well, uh, then it will be based on the WDV of the asset given up. WDV of the asset given up has to be available because the machinery was there in your books. You will know in your books what is the value of the machinery. WDV of the asset received is not possible because it is in someone else's books, not in our books. Okay, this is the rule that you have to remember if the transaction has commercial substance. What do you mean by commercial substance? Well, loosely speaking, it is like a genuine barter. You are giving up machinery, you are acquiring land, you are giving up land, acquiring a private jet. These are genuine exchanges. 
However, if you are exchanging the almost the similar or same asset, let, that is you are acquiring, a, let us say, exchanging a grey color Honda City and acquiring another grey color Honda City, which has run the same miles and everything, really, there is no real exchange. I mean, there is an exchange, but that is really on paper. The position of the company pre and post the barter is almost the same because it is in possession of almost the similar or same asset and hence the barter is actually a paper transaction and not a real acquisition or a real sale. In which case, if the barter lacks commercial substance, and this will typically be given to you in the question that the transaction lacks substance, or you will be given that there are two completely similar assets and they are exchanged. In which case, you will take that the barter lacks commercial substance. In every other case, you will assume that the barter has commercial substance. So, over here, the PP in such a case will be recorded at the WDV of the assets given up. So, Whatever you are giving up, wohi value rega for whatever you have uh, received. So, for example, you have a car which has a WDB of 100, its market price may be 150. You are giving up that car and acquiring another car. You will not look at their WDVs and you will say that, well, the new car and the old car are almost similar. So, your journal entry will be new car account debit, for example, 100 to old car, 100. There will be no separate gain or loss that is getting recorded. This is a simple case of barter. Yes, there might be certain uh, part barters, part cash, which may be slightly more complex, but the principles used are still the same. We've tried to explain what lacks commercial substance means over here. Lacking commercial substance would kind of mean uh, that the company is in the same position pre and post the barter, uh, similar assets being exchanged. If nothing is given, remember, we will take that the barter has commercial substance. Okay, so that is uh, regarding special cases on initial recognition. Now you have initially recognized the asset. There are a few subsequent expenses that you incur for the asset. These subsequent expenses may be into two broad categories and two specific cases. First, regular repairs and maintenance. You have bought a car and you appoint someone to clean the car. You do the servicing for the car. These are regular repairs and maintenance expenses. These repairs and maintenance expenses maintain the capacity of the asset. They don't increase the efficiency beyond what is originally assessed. And as a result, these expenses will be taken to the PL account. On the other hand, you might inc incur certain expenses which either increase the life or increase the efficiency of the asset beyond what is originally assessed. For example, you fit a CNG engine system inside your car. Now, earlier your car had only a petrol injection system through which the mileage that your car was giving was, let us say, for every 100 rupees spent, your car would run around 15 or 20 kilometers. But with CNG, for every 100 rupees of gas, it runs for, let us say, 50 kilometers. So the efficiency of the car improves beyond what is originally assessed in which case you will capitalize loosely speaking so over here repairs and maintenance expenses will be expensed to the PL, whereas uh, expenses which increase the life or increase the efficiency beyond what is originally assessed will be capitalized this is a standard guidance which was even there in as10 now one specific case which i would rate as important over here one specific case would be uh, what if there is a major replacement or a major inspection or a major overhaul for example, you have an air conditioner, a split AC, which has an indoor unit and then an outdoor uh, compressor. The outdoor compressor is a major component. After a few years, you see that uh, there is a defect in that major component and you need to replace that component, which is quite expensive. It's a major part. What do you do? Well, the standard says, forget the guidance over here, whether it is repairs or maintenance or increased life or efficiency. If a major part has to be replaced, then you have to add the cost of the new part. Okay. So, it increases life efficiency. We don't see that. You have to add the cost of the new part. Sir, why? Because the standard says it's a replacement. Real accounts. Asset is a real account. Debit what comes in, credit what goes out. So, if a particular part, that is the new compressor is coming in, a particular part that is an old compressor is going out. So, if the entire AC was sold, you would have recognized a gain or loss. In a similar way, if a major part of the AC has been uh, transferred, sold, derecognized, it has to be removed from the books. So, the standard over here says that you take the WDB of the entire AC. For example, you purchase the AC uh, uh, for 100 rupees, the life was 10 years. Four years have passed by, so the depreciation would be 10, 10, 10 each year for a period of four years. So this would have been 100 minus 40. So the WDB of the entire AC is 60 rupees. You buy a new compressor and the new compressor, for example, costs you 30. The entry has to be AC account debit to bank. You will add the cost of the new part. Now the challenge arises, how do you find the WDB of the old compressor? Because when ideally, 
when you bought the AC, you got only one invoice, which was hundred rupees. Likha tha. If you had the breakup, excellent. Then you will know that in today's date, out of this sixty, how much is attributable to uh, the compressor? So the first preference, if you want to find the cost of the old part, will be the breakup as per the supplier's invoice. If the supplier's invoice gives a breakup, like for example, if you are assembling a PC. Assembling a PC, not buying a laptop, then you will exactly know the breakup of the processor, of the motherboard, of the computers, uh, hard disk, everything. The breakup will be there in the supplies invoice. However, if you buy a laptop, there is no breakup in the supplies invoice. It is fact based. So, if there's a breakup available uh, uh, at the time of purchase, take that. If not, then the fair value of the part at the time of purchase, if that is available, this has to be given to you in the question. The most important thing is the third part. If none of the two is available, then what do you do? Upon hat khade kar dege? Nahi. The standard says that a new part is purchased. Let that be a proxy. To the old part, so the cost of the new part, for example, thirty, is assumed to be the cost of the old part as well. Now this is the last preference, but something better than nothing. But that thirty is the cost today. You bought DSC four years back, so probably there would be some time value adjustment or inflation every year. The price of AC is increasing, for example. In which case, one can say that okay, if the part cost thirty today, that does not mean it cost thirty four years back. So four years back, how much will it be? Let us say the time value adjustment has to be done. Let us say a discount factor is used at the rate of ten percent. In which case, one can say okay, if thirty was the cost of the part today. And there's a 10% inflation or time value adjustment. Then four years back, let's say if I discount it at 10% for a bit of four years, I get 0.683. So I will get let us say 30 into 0.68, which is approximately 20, for example. So one can say that well, out of this 100 rupees, 20 is attributable to the old part, which means. uh well when 100 gets depreciated as a part of that the 20 also gets depreciated what you have to de recognize is the wdv of the old part 100 can the 20 have but it 20 be to depreciate hua rahega no when 100 depreciates 20 also depreciates over a period of 4 years 8 rupees will be the depreciation and hence 12 rupees loosely speaking will be the wdv of the part today debit what comes in the new part is coming in so you add that 30 credit what goes out So this is subtracted minus, and hence uh, you will get, for example, seventy-eight uh, to be the revised WDV of the asset. If on scrapping you got two rupees for the old compressor, your general entry would have been bank account debit two rupees, loss on partial derecognition ten rupees, to let us say AC or the old compressor twelve. Basically, you have to credit the compressor by twelve rupees. Okay. And the last part is, if there is expenditure incurred for a damaged asset, damaged asset can be a car, uh, for example, which has suffered a major accident. Actually, if the car had suffered a major accident, typically there would be impairment under Indus 36, and you would have recognized the loss on uh, the car in the profit and loss account. You would have recognized this loss that is an impairment loss in the profit and loss account. So your car in your books, which was worth hundred. After the damage is now worth only forty rupees. You have incurred another thirty or thirty uh, uh, rupees to repair that damage. Such a cost should be added to the cost of the car because the car is now a damaged car, and the expenditure that you increase rectifies the damage. However, if there are some minor scratches on the car, you don't recognize an impairment for that. You still do some denting work and painting work for those scratches. You don't add it to the cost of the car because you have not recognized the damage in the first place. Damage आपने जो भी हुआ है वो scratches वगैरह जो लगे आपने recognize ही नहीं किया उसके लिए. You said okay these are minor scratches does not result in impairment. Then the expenditure to repair those scratches should go to the P&L because the asset is still worth hundred rupees. It is still in the books at least an undamaged asset because you have not recognized any. Uh, uh, damage cost. So, if the asset is impaired at the time of damage, then the subsequent repair cost will be capitalized. Impaired means the asset's value is reduced. So, repair cost can increase the asset's value. If the asset is not impaired, then the asset's value itself is not reduced, and the repair cost should not increase further the value of the asset. The repair cost in such a case will be expensed to the P&L. Okay, this is for subsequent expenditure. Then comes subsequent valuation. Now. As per India 16, this is an accounting policy choice. An entity has to decide whether it wants to follow a particular model. That is either the cost model, in which case the asset will be shown at the origin cost minus the accumulated depreciation. Revaluation in such a case will be prohibited. Or it wants to follow the revaluation model. It is entirely on the entity to decide. In case an entity decides the revaluation model, it will have to revalue at sufficient intervals. Sufficient intervals over here have been defined as 
annual intervals for assets with volatile values like gold for example or three to five years for assets with largely stable values for example furniture has a largely stable value so over here revaluation model if you select then you have to do revaluation at sufficient intervals fair value has to be determined at sufficient intervals okay so this is an accounting policy choice sir once you decide uh, can you change it? Yes. If you decide to change it and that too is rare circumstances, index 8 will apply. This will be treated as a change in accounting policy and will require ret retrospective application unless it is impracticable. Ajha, sir, uh, if I decide a cost model, then do all my assets across my company have to be recognized that using cost model only? No. This selection is based on what you call as a class of PP. What do you mean by class of PP? Class of PP refers to assets having a similar nature and a similar end use. If your assets have a similar nature and a similar end use, like for example, if I have a Toyota Innova for transporting passengers, I also have a, a, a Toyota Etios for transporting passengers. These are different car models, but their end use, their nature is largely the same. However, I have a Again, a motor vehicle, which is like a bulldozer, which is like a crane. At the end of the day, it's a motor vehicle. However, the nature and the end use of the bulldozer or a crane is completely different from that of a car. So at the end, both of them may be motor vehicles, but they are having a different nature and end use. And hence, I can decide to show my cars using, let us say, the revolution model, but my construction vehicles using the cost model. However, I cannot decide that by Innova, I am going to show using the cost and ETOS using revaluation. No, because they are having the same class. The consistency has to be there for a class of PP. Okay, so uh, these are the features. Revaluation has to be done for a class of PP. Revaluation has to be done at sufficient intervals. Uh, and if there is a change, it is treated as a change in accounting policy. What is the accounting treatment in case? Of revaluation cost model there's nothing much but what is the change uh, what happens if there is an upward revaluation well if there's an initial upward revaluation you will credit the revaluation surplus or the revaluation reserve which is a part of other comprehensive income OCI however if there is an initial downward revaluation using the principles of conservatism and prudence the standard has said upward revaluation is again you do not recognize again till the time it is realized so you put it inside the revaluation surplus however if it's an initial downward revaluation you take it to the profit and loss account so if it is initial downward pnl if it is initial upward in the revaluation surplus now the problem arises if after an initial upward for example let us say this was land worth 100 initial upward uh, so 50 was the upward revaluation becomes 150 there is a subsequent downward revaluation so now in the next year the assets value falls down to 70 rupees in which case there is a fall of 80 from 150 minus 80 in the subsequent years where will this 80 go well the law says that the first you will take from the balance existing in the revaluation surplus and excess that is 50 rupees over here and excess if any that is 30 will be adjusted against the profit and loss account same guidance applies even in case of a downward revaluation so let us say you go from 100 to 70 and then from 70 to 150 in which case there's an upward subsequent upward devaluation of 80 in which case first you will reverse this 30 so this 30 will go to the profit and loss account if it is subsequent upward then first you will take to the pnl that is 30 rupees to the extent it was earlier taken and excess even that is 50 to the revaluation surplus now revaluation surplus over here remember is a part of other comprehensive income which is a non-reclassifiable other comprehensive income which means the balance in the revaluation surplus should never be transferred to the statement of the PL. it cannot be shown as a part of other income revenue from operations etc so does that mean that it will always permanently remain as a part of revaluation surplus no on the happening of certain events it can be transferred to retained earnings directly like an appropriation like in your inter -say, you used to transfer from pnl to general reserve general reserve to pnl something like that you can transfer the balance in the revaluation reserve directly to the retained earnings and not let it impact the net profit ultimately it will increase your net worth but it will not impact your net profit it is a reserve to reserve adjustment probably the institute has done this because it says that well you had a choice of showing at cost or at fair value you thought that i want to show the gains or losses in each year as and when they happen and you have presented these gains or losses as a part of oci as and when they happen now when you realize it that does not again result in a gain it just results in a gain which was earlier unrealized is now realized so the profits which are earlier non-distributable can now be distributable so you transfer it to the return earnings let us say okay so when do you transfer it to return earnings well the standard has given you two scenarios it has said that 
some entities like to transfer it to returned earnings on a periodic basis. The revaluation was done on the asset. The asset depreciates. So as the asset depreciates, the value of the asset falls. After a few years, the asset will become zero. Technically, revaluation surplus should also match that pattern. And as a result, an entity may, it is not compulsory, an entity may transfer the balance in the revaluation surplus to the returned earnings in the ratio of depreciation as and when the asset depreciates. This is not mandatory. If an entity wants, it can do so. However, whether an entity decides to transfer in the ratio of depreciation or not, once the asset is sold at the time of sale, whatever is the remaining balance attributable to that asset in the revaluation surplus has to be transferred to the return earnings. So over here, so you will have the balance will be maybe return off in the ratio of depreciation directly to return earnings at the time of sale, the remaining whatever is the remaining balance has to be transferred directly to return earnings. It is a part of a non reclassifiable OCI as per index. Now we are proceeding to the last sections of this standard depreciation we've been doing this since our infancy jab se 11th mein aaya tab se depreciation hamara picha nahi chhod raha depreciation uh, defined as wear and tear of the asset uh, uh, due to efflux of time obsolescence passage of time blah 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 ye sab humko pata hai what about the accounting what are the methods well the methods of depreciation can be slm can be wdv can be units of production it can be any method which fairly depicts the pattern of economic benefits that you expect to get from the asset so over here the methods over here are based on the pattern of economic benefits expected it can be slm wdv units of production etc as per index 16 listen to this very carefully as per index 16 this is a matter of an accounting estimate you decide the method based on your estimate of how the economic benefits are going to be earned from the asset like for building you estimate the benefits to be received equally but for items like computer you expect that the more recent the technology the more the benefits the older the technology less are the benefits in which case you might take wdv for the computer slm for the building based on your estimate of the pattern of economic benefits typically while calculating depreciation you will take the cost of the asset you will also estimate the salvage value you will also estimate the useful life can these estimates change well yes sir if they change do we have to prospectively apply or retrospectively it will be a prospective application not a retrospective one because it is a change in the accounting estimate and not a change in accounting policy and hence it will have to be prospectively applied the estimate of useful life as well as salvage value in fact the standard tells you that the management is required to annually assess whether these estimates are still reliable or not so there will be an annual review to be done for these estimates Okay, the important part is what if you decide to change the method of depreciation in the older days when you might have done inter foundation etc. You must have you may have studied that this is an accounting policy. However, index categorically mentions that this is not an accounting policy. This is an accounting estimate. So if you bought a computer, you started depreciating it based on WDV. Two years later, you thought that we are chartered accountants. We are working in a CA office. We barely Excel ke thode functions use karte, word ke thode functions use karte. The technology, the processor speed does not really matter to us as much. And as a result, the benefits that this computer is giving me is expected to be uniform over the five years of the useful life. And it is not right to believe that wo, uh, 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 technology ke linked. Hai. So this is a change in our estimate of the pattern of benefits expected to be received and hence index 16 mentions that this is a change in accounting estimate and not a change in accounting policy and hence it will have to be prospectively applied which means that if you had taken for example a 30 percent uh, WDV depreciation then 100 minus 30 let us say this is 70 30% of this would be 21. For example, this is 49 at the end of the sec uh, second year. Now, you will not touch the past. You will depreciate it. You will take 49 as the base and depreciate it over the remaining three years. Uh, 49 divided by 3, Joby number aata, will be the depreciation per annum. You will not retrospectively restate. Okay, so this is regarding the depreciation method. And lastly, the component method. Achha, this was also prescribed in Schedule 2, I guess, to the Companies Act. It is now a part of India 16 as well. What do you mean by component method? Well, if your asset is something which has major components, okay, sir, every asset has components, like a car has 2000 components, okay, we'll discuss that. If your asset is something which has major components and those components have a life which is different from the life of the asset, 
इन विच केस यू हैव टू यूज द कॉम्पोनेंट मेथड सर नहीं समझ में आ रहा फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू गो एंड बाई अ फर्निस्ड फ्लैट वर्स इज अन फर्निश्ड फ्लैट क्या आपको सेम प्राइस पर दोनों मिलता है नहीं फॉर एग्जाम्पल थाउजेंड स्क्वायर फीट फर्निश्ड फ्लैट इन मुंबई में कॉस्ट यू थ्री करोस वेज एन अनफर्निश्ड फ्लैट लेट से दिस इज एन अनफर्निश्ड फ्लैट वेर इज अ फर्निश्ड फ्लैट माइट कॉस्ट यू थ्री पॉइंट फाइव करोस फर्निश्ड फ्लैट so if the area is same everything is same then why are you paying 50 lakhs more well you are paying 50 lakhs more for the furniture acha the flat ye sab agreement mein nahi likha rahega agreement mein bola rahega you buy this entire property for 3.5 crores if no component method is applied let us say the life of the asset uh, or of the flat is 35 years you would say okay 3.5 crores divided by 35 baat khatam depreciation par hai however that is wrong because out of that 3.5 crores 3 crores has a life of 35 years that is a flat however the remaining 50 lakhs has a life of only let us say 7 years or a life of only 5 years it is furniture does not go on for 35 years and hence if i take 3.5 crores divided by uh, 35 years it will give me a slightly wrong depreciation and hence 50 lakhs is a major part out of the 3.5 crores a major has not been defined but if a separate component is given we assume that it is major and that component has a separate use for life so the ideal approach would be well this 3.5 crores you will say 3 crores to be depreciated over 35 years whereas the 0.5 crores will be depreciated over the 5 years which is a useful life which will give you a much more accurate number of depreciation this is a mandatory treatment that has to be followed so asset which has major components like a building might have major components like uh, a lift inside a building might have a different life for example uh, and these components have separate life acha in case of a car a car is an engine engine is a major component but the engine's life is same as a car's life in which case you don't need to apply the component method component method makes sense only the life of the asset is different from the life uh, of the part if that is the case then you will depreciate the part over the life of the part and the remaining asset over the life of the asset in really rare circumstances and there are a couple of problems as well uh, we are not going to too much detail in rare circumstances it might happen that the life of the part exceeds the life of the asset in which case you will depreciate the part over the life of the asset only you cannot depreciate the part beyond the life of the asset uh, uh, so this logic applies for any component of the cost of the asset the component may be a part it may be a major inspection cost like in case of aircraft or a major overhaul that you have to do in case of ships as long as it is major you have to do it so this is the application of component method and the depreciation uh, that should be done based on the life of the components and the last part for which there are two particular problems in the institute study material which is changes in the provision for two or three problems provision for site restoration remember the estimate of site restoration can change so for example you had uh, estimated that you will spend 50 crores after or 50 lakhs after 10 years uh, and the discounting factor was 10% so what will happen is years 1 your opening balance would have been let us say 20 loosely speaking this is 50 into point uh, 683 i think upon a uh, 50 liya tha 50 into point 683 nahi i taken it something i don't know i don't remember chalo theek hai uh, jo bhi number rahega so let us say uh, we are expecting to spend 50 after 5 years so this comes to for example 35 35 now what happens is as each year passes you come closer and closer to um, you come closer and closer to uh, 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 the date of payment so 35 will slowly 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 go towards 50 so this is a process which is called as unwinding which is recognized as finance cost it is due to passage of time finance cost at the rate of 10% slowly slowly other agar aap kuch bhi na karo to 5 saal tak wo 35 hi pada hua rahega but you have to spend 50 rupees slowly slowly as each year passes time value adjustment is done and because it is attributed to time it is finance cost called as unwinding of discount so your closing will become let us say 38.5 second year this is 38.5 for example this is 3.85 your closing now becomes 38.5 plus 3.85 is 42.35 and loosely speaking it will slowly slowly proceed towards 50 rupees yahan pe apan approximate numbers de ke rakhe however so this is nothing but 50 into 50 uh, this is expected to be spent after let us say uh, Three years. You are at the end of the second year, so you fifty expect kar rahe hum, but spend hone wale three years ke baad. So this is present value factor at the rate of ten percent for the third year. If you 
फाइंड दिस इज पॉइंट सेवन फाइव सो फिफ्टी इंटू पॉइंट सेवन फाइव एक सेकेंड ये गड़बड़ लग रहा है आई हैव टेकन रॉन्ग नंबर्स टू स्टार्ट विद आई गेस दिस इज दिस शुड बी पॉइंट फिफ्टी इंटू फिफ्थ ईयर का डिस्काउंट फैक्टर इज पॉइंट सिक्स टू वन फिफ्टी इंटू पॉइंट सिक्स टू वन सो दिस इज अराउंड थर्टी वन सो डिस्काउंट थ्री पॉइंट वन सो दैट इज थर्टी फोर पॉइंट वन थर्टी फोर पॉइंट वन एंड थ्री पॉइंट फोर वन सो थर्टी फोर पॉइंट वन प्लस थ्री पॉइंट फोर वन एंड दिस इज अराउंड थर्टी सेवन पॉइंट फाइव एज यू कैन सी ओवर हियर दिस कूड हैव बीन फिफ्टी इंटू पॉइंट सेवन फाइव वन सो दिस वुड बी थर्टी सेवन पॉइंट फाइव अप्रॉक्सीमेटली हाव एवर एट द एंड ऑफ द सेकेंड ईयर यू बिलीव कि पचास में नहीं होगा साइट रिस्टोरेशन यू विल हैव टू स्पेंड सिक्सटी सो लेट अस एन इंक्रीज इन द साइट रिस्टोरेशन एक्सपेंस दिस इज एन एस्टिमेट विच यू मेड विच इज चेंजिंग सो देर विल बी नो रेट्रोस्पेक्टिव चेंज इट इज अ प्रोस्पेक्टिव चेंज एट द एंड ऑफ द सेकंड ईयर यू बिलीव दैट देर इज गोइंग टू बी अ चेंज सो दिस इज नाउ सिक्सटी इंटू पॉइंट सेवन फाइव वन यू आर गोइंग टू स्पेंड मनी आफ्टर थ्री ईयर्स ओनली However, uh, well, this is going to be forty-five. अच्छा, so your provision will have to increase. Ideally, आपका provision का ledger balance would have been thirty-seven point five, but now अभी उसको forty-five पे लेके जाना पड़ेगा. So this is an increase of seven point five, loosely speaking. अच्छा, तो इसका journal entry क्या होएगा? Is a question over here. You will have to credit the provision for sure. The problem is, what are you going to debit? The provision is credited by 7.5 sir how did we credit 7.5 well there was an increase in the estimate by 10 rupees and this 10 rupees is going to be spent after 3 years from the date of change so this is 10 into 0.751 which will come to let us say 7.5 so this is provision credited by 7.5 something will be debited the standard over here says that if you are following the cost model this 10 rupees increases the cost of the asset you thought that 50 rupees would be spent 60 ho gaya this increases the cost of the asset and hence the present value of the changes that is 7.5 on the date of change will be adjusted against the cost of the asset the present value of the changes will be adjusted directly against the cost of the ppe there will be no retrospective effect since it is a change in the accounting estimate and not a change in accounting policy a, a complex assessment arises uh, uh, on case of a revaluation model if there's a revaluation model you can adjust the cost of pp however the institute and also as per the appendix to index 16 have adjusted it against revaluation surplus which is which is fair so i would stick to that approach better to go with the institute's approach in case of revaluation surplus if there is a change in the value of the provision then that change should ideally affect the uh, uh, affect the value of the asset however as in the revaluation model any changes in the value of the asset is actually rooted through the revaluation surplus and as a result if there is a change in the provision for site restoration that change will be adjusted against the revaluation surplus and if the balance in the revaluation surplus is not adequate then in the profit and loss account you can also adjust it against the cost of the pp and then do a subsequent revaluation but rather than doing that follow the institute's working which will be more uh, 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 more better so you adjust the pv of the changes against the balance in the revaluation surplus if any an excess if applicable will go to the profit and loss account so over here the changes will be in the revaluation assuming this was a revaluation model on an overly simplistic basis obviously yahan pe kuch aur change bhi aayega so the debit will go to the revaluation and if there is no balance in the revaluation then to the profit and loss this is in case of part b whereas if i were to look at part a then you will directly adjust the pp or the asset as a case may be okay better if you do numericals on this for a better understanding i've tried to give you an overview i hope uh, this lecture was helpful and uh, you have uh, been able to revise the entire pp uh, please do let me know uh, uh, your feedback or if you like the video please do press the like button and subscribe thank you very much for your time wish you all the very best for your exams take care and see you soon